Fallout 4 is a game rated M by the ESRB. Hello everyone and welcome back to more Steven Plays Fallout 4. A little different with the inclusion of face cam, if you want to call it that. Uh, today is a very special video. We are actually going to be doing a mini documentary about Nora Jones, the creation and behind the scenes process of Nora Jones and the Nora Jones episodes. Although we'll be talking a fair bit about Grit as well. He plays an important role in all of this. Now it should go without saying, but this video will absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, spoil Fallout 4 as a game. It will also spoil Fallout 4 the Let's Play up to this point. So if you're watching the series and you decided to jump ahead and see this video, I would advise you to stay on the track you're on. This video is going to spoil everything up to this point because we're going to be talking very openly and freely about the Let's Play in the game. So. If you haven't experienced all of the Let's Play or all of the game, you may want to turn back now. For everyone else, strap in. We have a lot to talk about. So last episode, Grit finished the main game. But before he did that, he imagined Nora beating the game. And Nora did beat the game. Four times. I want to spend today's mini-doc talking about Nora Jones and the creation process, but in order to adequately do that, we have to start by talking about Grit. And we need to back way, way up. First, I want to say that Steven Plays has one of the best communities on YouTube. This is something I've known for a long time, but the Fallout 4 comments section is a shining example of that. People, since the beginning of the Let's Play, have always done a great job of giving me gameplay tips and not spoiling the game. And I really appreciate this, because this allows me to get genuine tips, but also be genuinely surprised when something cool happens. Like the reveal that Sean, your son, is the head of the Institute. That is something that was hidden from me. The fact that you guys managed to do that for so long is incredible. You guys have also done some really interesting things, like teasing the Red Death as being this crazy boss fight, when in fact it was just a tiny little monster, and those sorts of things are really fun too. But there was only a month or two into the series before I started reading comments about factions. Which faction are you going to choose? Hmm, is Steven a railroad guy? I don't know. Maybe he'll go Brotherhood. Is he with the Minutemen? There's all these things I started to read, and uh, it didn't take long for me to put two and two together and figure out that the game was most likely going to be shoehorning me into choosing a side. Now, as a completionist, I hate that. I want to be able to experience as much of the game as possible. So after I started reading comments and figuring out that there were going to be factions that were going to lock me out of potential missions, I decided that since I wanted to try and complete as much of the game as possible, that I would avoid factions for as long as I possibly could. I don't specifically remember when I learned there was a peaceful ending. Um, it was probably a year or more into the Let's Play, but I vaguely recall seeing a comment that kind of alluded to the fact that there was a peaceful ending. And I thought, if that exists, that's what I want. Because up to that point, Grit had proven himself to be neither good nor bad, but primarily a survivor. Uh, he was seeking after his son, but only when he wasn't befriending companions. Grit had a reputation from early in the Let's Play of romancing just about everyone he ran into. When I decided to embrace the idea that Grit was polyamorous, and that he was in loving, healthy relationships with these people, and not just having one-night stands with everyone, it made more sense than ever to aim for a peaceful ending. Because breaking away from the factions meant losing some of these companions. And the companions were Grit's life. Um, they were his friends and his lovers. And, you know, if, if he had to break away from a faction, that would mean losing some of these people. So I decided that what made the most sense for Grit's character was a peaceful ending. And if there was a peaceful ending, I was going to get it. As we started to get closer and closer to the end of the game, and our options started to really whittle away, um, I actually started to get some comments about this peaceful ending again, this fifth ending. And they were comments from longtime viewers, people who understood that I wasn't looking to be spoiled, but also knew that I may not know about this peaceful ending, and they were trying to let me know that there was another way. And it was so interesting because these people were really trying to tiptoe around things without spoiling everything, and I appreciate it. But they gave me just enough info to know which missions to do, which missions to stop at. Um, and I started to piece together everything I needed to do without actually being spoiled. Getting the elusive peaceful ending 
uh, isn't particularly difficult, but it does require jumping through some pretty strange hoops. For example, uh, you'll be able to do certain missions, but not others. And some missions you can start, but you can't finish. And then even weirder, you'll have to avoid some characters. There's a few characters, after a certain point, that if they start talking to you, can actually trigger events that piss off factions. So, it's a little weird, but fortunately the commenters had warned me about all of these things so I could keep it in mind. Now, what's interesting is that when I was reading the comments at this time, people started to notice the erratic behavior of Grit. Grit might completely avoid certain people. Grit might start a mission, but then not bother finishing it. So, a few people actually correctly guessed that maybe Grit was going for this, you know, peaceful ending. But, before anyone could confirm anything, we got to episode 200. And then Grit sat in a chair. And Nora began. So the question all of you want to know, where did the idea for Nora come from? Well, uh, it was born out of necessity. See, after doing what is essentially a 100% run of Skyrim, I moved into Fallout 4 with the same expectations of myself. I wanted to cover everything, play every mission, do a 100% run of Fallout 4. And after, you know, realizing that there were going to be certain paths that were blocked, certain times I would have to choose between options A and B, and not being able to show every single mission, um, it was a little disheartening, but it wasn't too different from Skyrim. Also, possible Skyrim LP spoilers here. Sorry. Skyrim also has a few places where the story splits into different paths. In the main quest, you'll be forced to choose between one of two sides in the Great War. There's a big war going on in Skyrim and you'll have to choose side A or side B. Same thing in the Dawnguard DLC. There's two factions fighting and you have to choose between side A and side B. So I kept choosing the side A, but I really wanted to see what happened on the side B. So I talked to my buddy Chaz, who then created a mod for the PC version where I could actually swap my protagonist, and my companion. See, for the entire length of the game, the entire length of the LP, I had been playing as Argyle the Argonian, and my companion was Feindol the Wood Elf. But, with the help of this mod, I could switch things. I could play as Feindol the Wood Elf, and my companion would be Argyle. This was really, really cool, and I did it as a dream sequence. Argyle went to sleep, and he basically woke up as Feindol, and I was able to take a few episodes and cover all of the content that I had never shown off before. But the important thing was that I could do it within the lore that I had created. See, Skyrim has its own lore. It has its own world, and I, I understand that. But within that game, I was creating my own lore. The lore of Argyle and Feindol and Lil Breckfleck. So I wanted to make sure that whatever I did to show off this extra content, I was doing it by my rules with my own lore, and it worked, and people really, really loved it. The problem is that Skyrim only ever has two paths max. Fallout 4 has four factions, which means that if I wanted to show off everything, I would have to play through the game four times. This obviously presented a problem. Also, unlike Skyrim, where I had just one companion with me, Feindel, for the entire Let's Play, in Fallout 4, I had a lot of companions all of the companions. So if I was only going to go through the game four more times, how do I decide who to take with me? See, Feindel was special. He was around for absolutely everything. From the beginning to the end of the Let's Play, he was there and saw everything that I did. When I did Fallout 4, I did it very differently, because I didn't use just one companion, I used all of them. And I'm glad that I did it that way, because for one, it's different than Skyrim, which is nice. But number two, there's a mechanical reason. In Skyrim, the companions don't give you anything special for using them. They're just there to help you in combat. Um, but in Fallout, if you spend some amount of time with a companion, they give you a perk. So using all of the companions and trying to get all of their perks is something that makes sense. But the issue is that in Fallout 4, I had only ever spent maybe 20 to 25 episodes tops with any particular companion. And in Skyrim, I used Feindel for the entire thing. Feindel was special, but none of the companions in Fallout 4 were special enough. Now, I did consider just using alternate versions of Grit, so when he sat in the chair, he would just imagine himself doing certain things. And I had one big issue with that, and that was Grit himself would be 
gaining levels and perks and getting items that he ultimately wouldn't get to keep. Because after having completed something, he would be reloading the save and starting again on the next faction and the next faction before he ultimately would do the fifth ending for real. And I thought that that would be confusing for viewers. It would be confusing for me. Grit finds a really cool shotgun, but it was Brotherhood faction Grit, so he doesn't get to keep it. So I started to think outside the box, and finally it hit me. Nora. When I originally decided to play as Nora, I thought it was only going to be one of the four playthroughs. The problem was I couldn't come up with anyone else as meaningful to go through any of the other three. Briefly, I actually considered doing one of the playthroughs as Sean, but after I started poking around the Fallout wiki and figuring out that in every ending you confront Sean in some way, then I was like, okay, maybe that would be not such a good idea. The other thing I started to think about was time. I needed to play through the game four more times. That was crazy. Even if I booked it as fast as I could from quest to quest, it was going to take far too long for a series that's supposed to release twice a week. It started to make a lot more sense to use Nora for all four playthroughs. I would just play through the game once, getting up to the point of no return, where Grit currently was, basically, and then make a save. If I changed my clothes for all four of the playthroughs, everything would work out. When Grit finally got to episode 200 and sat down, I didn't have everything completely planned out. I knew I wanted Grit to have the peaceful ending, and I knew I wanted Nora to show off the alternatives. I also had a few ideas cemented for Nora's character, but not everything. So let's take a few minutes now and talk about what it was like to plan Nora. One of the major differences between Skyrim and Fallout 4 is that in Skyrim your abilities increase as you use them. Because of this, it's actually very easy to max out all of your abilities in a single playthrough. You just have to use them. But in Fallout 4, it works very differently. Each level up gives you a perk point, and those perk points are used on a variety of perks. 275, to be exact. And anyone who's watched Fallout 4 for a while, or has played it, will know that getting to level 275 in a playthrough is basically impossible. Grit has done pretty much everything there is to do in the game, and he's not even level 90. Because Grit could never realistically get to level 275, and thus show off all the abilities of the game, I decided that I wanted Nora to show off some of these alternative abilities. And one of the biggest ones was Melee. Over the course of his 200 episodes, Grit had used exclusively guns, and there was a reason for that. Um, melee relies on strength, and Grit has never had a lot of strength, so Grit gravitated towards guns. But because there was such a, a cry for melee weapons to be shown in the Let's Play, I figured that Nora was the perfect time to do that. So I decided to build her character very differently from Grit's, and the first step was strength. So these are the starting special stats for Nora. You'll probably notice something odd. We're focusing a whole lot on agility for a melee-based character. There's a reason for that. As it turns out, melee builds are ridiculously powerful in Fallout 4, thanks to the combination of two very important perks. The first is Agility 9, Blitz. This perk allows you to essentially teleport when doing melee attacks in VATS. The second level rank can work from nearly an entire room away. Over on Strength 9, you'll see Rooted, which gives you huge offensive and defensive bonuses as long as you're standing still when attacking. Guess what? If you use VATS, you always count as standing still. So upon exiting the vault and using the Your Special book to raise agility to 9, I can use my first few perks to warp across the room and do massive damage while doing it. Charisma is at 3 to give me access to Lone Wanderer, which gives you even more defense and lets you carry more weight as long as you're not with a companion. At higher ranks, it actually raises your attack power too. The great thing about Lone Wanderer is that dog meat doesn't count as a companion, so you can still keep your dog with you. If you don't need a companion, and I didn't as I had already showed them all off, it is a great way to get bonuses. The last weird thing you'll notice is that my luck is 5, and that's to get Idiot Savant, single-handedly the best perk in the entire game. I'm serious. I used my first perk point on Idiot Savant, and as soon as I got to level 11, I put another point into it. It will randomly multiply the experience points that you earn by 5. 5! 
Finishing a mission that gives you 500 experience? Well, guess what? Now you're getting 2,500. Now, it doesn't happen every time, but it does happen enough that it makes a gigantic difference. And when you're on a tight schedule and desperately trying to advance in level and get through the game quickly, Idiot Savant is a must. Now, my decision to utilize Idiot Savant also meant keeping Nora's intelligence at one, since the lower your character's intelligence, the better that perk works. That meant she'd never be able to hack terminals, since that's in the intelligence tree. It also created a hilarious issue with the lore of Nora. From the beginning of the game, we know that Nora is a very successful lawyer. The main characters make mention of it before the bombs fall, and you can see her diploma and books around the house. It makes no sense for her intelligence to be one. And yet, it is. The comments actually picked up on this, and they decided that she won her cases with her intimidating strength. And honestly, I thought that that was hilarious. That is canon, as far as I'm concerned. I also made the decision to avoid the lockpicking perk, since that used up valuable points that could go elsewhere. So Nora was a fierce fighter, but wouldn't be able to get into anything she couldn't find the key or password for. Another thing I knew before starting was that I wanted to spend some points maxing out Nora's charisma. I thought it'd be cool if smooth talking was something Grit and Nora shared, plus it would allow me to choose any speech options I wanted in the upcoming playthroughs. I used a lot of my early levels putting points into charisma. Otherwise, my focus would be on raw power. I'd put perks into my melee abilities and increasing my damage output. I also knew how I wanted to approach the endings. Obviously, I'd be playing through each faction, but the order did matter. I decided I would be starting with the Minutemen, since that was the most neutral, but also because Grit's ending was going to be extremely similar. Putting the two of those as far apart from each other seemed like a really good plan. I decided that the Brotherhood and Railroad should come next, since they, along with the Minutemen, all produce a Institute Destroyed outcome. I saved the Institute for last, since it's so incredibly different, and it seemed like a good thing to end on. I had my plan, and it was time to start the game and put it into action. Oh, and did I mention that I didn't do any of this on my personal Xbox account? Even though you can have separate characters with a single Xbox user, the thought of even possibly screwing up or deleting Grit's file made my stomach turn. So, I made a completely new user on my Xbox who I called Mrs. Grit Jones. The only downside is that I couldn't get the achievements on my normal file, but I've never really cared about those, so no harm done. When starting the game, I chose very easy for the difficulty, and there were two main reasons for that. For one, it makes the game easier, and I can get through it faster, which is important, but number two, it makes Nora appear far more powerful than she actually is. I really wanted to build up the fact that Nora is a crazy powerhouse of a character, and is actually far scarier than Grit. When you see Nora punch difficult enemies to death in a few blows, enemies that Grit frequently struggles with, it helps establish just how powerful Nora is. I actually started dropping hints about the upcoming Nora episodes months before they debuted, making allusions to Nora's strength and talking about how she was so much stronger than her husband. It was also months before when I knew hairbrushes would be Nora's obsession, so Grit began having stronger and stronger reactions to finding them. Fancy hairbrush, get out of my life. <laughs> I'm taking you just cause I love my wife. We already knew what Nora looked like because I had designed her in the first episode of Fallout. Fortunately, I actually saved the raw footage of that first episode, which means that I could go back and reference it to make sure that all of the facial features of Grit and Nora were identical. It also meant that Sean would look the same too. Now, you have to understand something. When I first started this Nora project, the scope was completely different. Originally, I had planned to only show the missions that Grit couldn't do, and of course, the subsequent endings. But, after I had played for about two or three hours as Nora, and I hadn't yet recorded anything, I started to think, maybe I should record this stuff. You know, as B-roll. So, level seven Nora started capturing. And then slowly, everything changed. Suddenly I had even more ideas. Maybe I should show how Nora would approach the main quest. That'd be interesting, right? She could go in slightly different directions and choose some different speech options. So I did. And then I started to think about some of the quests that had multiple outcomes. I had always chosen one of the two options. I could use her to show off option two. You can actually see the remnants of this shift in the raw recordings. In the earlier recordings, I'm rushing through the game, plowing through dialogue as fast as I can. But when I decide that I may actually use this stuff, 
I let the dialogue fully complete. I got to the point where I really didn't know what the project was going to be, but it was growing far bigger than I originally expected. Later, I ended up cutting certain things from the early Raw recordings simply because I hadn't let the NPCs speak long enough to complete their sentences. One of the cool things about the first 13 hours of recording is that it didn't require any commentary whatsoever. At that point, I was just collecting B-roll for what I may use in the end product, and I got to just play Fallout 4, which sounds kind of weird, but you have to remember that I only ever play Fallout 4 40 minutes at a time. 40 minutes, twice a week. And I could listen to music. I actually had Spotify open the entire time for those 13 hours, and I just jammed out while playing the game. As I rolled into the 13 hour mark, I needed to do commentary for one very specific mission, long before I would start doing regular commentary for the Full Nora episodes. It's a mission that, honestly, almost no one ever gets to play, unless they know exactly what they're doing. That mission is plugging a leak. Plugging a leak is easily one of the least played missions in the game because of the ridiculous lengths you have to go to in order to get it. Most players of Fallout 4 find the railroad pretty early on. The game pushes you towards Diamond City, and there's plenty of dialogue and holotapes to point you in the right direction of their hideout. The very first mission for the railroad is Tradecraft, where you and Deacon return to the railroad's old headquarters. If you do this mission, plugging a leak is unavailable. And where is plugging a leak? The Institute. That means if you want to do plugging a leak, you have to more or less completely avoid the railroad, or at the very least, only say hello, never doing tradecraft, and then proceed through the entire main story, entering the Institute, and doing Institute missions until you complete Mankind Redefined, which, by the way, will prevent you from ever joining the railroad. So yes, doing this one mission means never joining the railroad. Obviously, I made a save before starting all this. Now, one thing I found super interesting is that even though I found the railroad early on as Nora, and then promptly avoided them so I could work on doing this mission, you actually can't enter the Institute without the railroad's help. In the main quest, you battle a courser and take it to Amari to help decode it. But she can't do it, and she points you towards the railroad. Whenever I got there, Desdemona was still standing outside where she had always been. The door that leads into the railroad HQ is locked until you complete Tradecraft, but if you bring the courser chip, she tells you to follow her and she goes inside. I just found it funny that she waits outside the entire game, you can't go in until you have the chip, and then you complete Mankind Redefined and you're blocked from ever joining the railroad. Anyway, once you've completed Mankind Redefined, you can get the Plugging Elite quest from Justin Ao. This was where I began commentating for the Nora episodes, and to be honest, it's a super weird place to start. I've already discussed how I wanted to do Minutemen, Brotherhood, Railroad, and Institute, in that order. So I was starting the final playthrough for Nora before I ever did any of the previous three. I knew ahead of time that I wanted each Nora to be different reflections of the same character. Each universe would be Nora, but they'd be Grit's interpretations of maybe different events that had shaped her as a person or changed her perception of the future. That's how we would wind up with playthroughs where Nora seemed very kind, but also playthroughs where she seemed quite ruthless. The problem was, I hadn't really finalized all of that stuff by the time I got to plugging a leak. I decided that Nora would be enthusiastic to her son's cause at the Institute, but still caring. Hilariously, this causes Institute Nora to be a bit of a roller coaster, since in her first Institute episode, the last bit of montage before this mission starts is her releasing synthetic gorillas to kill Institute workers. By the way, we'll talk more about that later. Plugging a leak has two possible outcomes. You either report Liam to Dr. Ao, or you frame Dr. Ao. Whoever you decide is banished from the Institute. However, this really only leaves us with one choice, and that's Liam. He's not necessary for any future quests, and doesn't show up in any Institute cutscenes, so I banished him. Remember, I've done all this work to show off plugging a leak, but as soon as I'm done, I'll be reloading to an earlier save so I can actually do the railroad. If I had banished Dr. Ao, he would have still been present when I did the Institute line, and that would have made no sense. Another interesting tidbit about this quest is I actually recorded it twice. In the first recording, I hadn't decided what to wear yet, and Nora is dressed in a coarser outfit. She also chooses slightly different responses. But what made me re-record it in the first place is that Nora herself kills Eve in this version. I didn't like that, and it didn't really fit in with her character at the time, so I re-recorded the quest and led Eve out into the lobby, where the Institute fired on her themselves. 
As a reminder, plugging a leak means that Liam is banished and Eve is dead, so neither will appear in the Institute. But, since I had to reload to an earlier save, and then later do all of the Institute quests again, it meant that both of them were alive and well in the Institute. That presented a problem for continuity, so I had to stealthily kill both of them. I killed Eve first, it was pretty easy, but I actually forgot to kill Liam until the very, very end. Fortunately, he wasn't in any of the cutscenes, at least I don't think so, so I don't think there was any continuity problems. After finishing plugging a leak and reloading the save, it would be another 10 hours of recording before commentating again, this time beginning the Minutemen playthrough. I thought it'd be appropriate to start where we left off, so I put Nora in the exact same chair that Grit had been sitting in. Of note is that the chair doesn't spawn there normally, it was something that Grit built, so I had to make sure Nora built an identical one in the same spot. I also decided on all the costumes that Nora would wear throughout her four playthroughs. In each playthrough, she's extremely loyal to that particular faction, so it makes sense that she would dress to match. I even came up with different ways to dress dog meat for each faction. Because I was uninterested in showing off any companions, Dogmeat would be accompanying Nora in each playthrough. It's also probably a good time to mention that, yes, the dog's names are always anagrams. In Grit's universe, the dog is named Wilma Lori, which is an anagram of Mallory Weir, my wife's maiden name. I decided to keep this theme going in the Nora episodes, but I didn't really come up with that until after I had finished the Minutemen playthrough, so he's just named Dogmeat here. You might occasionally see Piper in some of the montage stuff, I decided to travel with her and get her perk because it could help me level up even faster. As a result, she's in the background of a few shots here and there during some of the montage segments. Speaking of, the montage segments at the beginning of each playthrough might be my favorite part of doing this whole thing. They allow viewers to quickly understand who each Nora is and what her goals are without spending a lot of time fleshing it out. I was extremely thankful that I decided to expand the scope of the project and shoot all that B-roll. There's also a few recurring scenes in each of the four montages, with Nora choosing different speech options or actions depending on her character. It was easy to do, just make a save before engaging an NPC, and it added a lot to the overall project. The Minutemen playthrough was a great introduction to Nora, but it got flipped on its head when I released Fallout 204, the Brotherhood playthrough. I'm not gonna lie, Brotherhood was easily the most fun to roleplay, just because I got to be someone I'm not. I get to put myself in the shoes of a Brotherhood soldier who followed their leader first and their heart second. And the results were a lot of fun. But it was extremely difficult to roleplay because being ruthless really isn't my style. Honestly, doing commentary for all of the Nora stuff was extremely difficult. I've played 200 episodes as Grit, who is essentially just an extension of myself, so he's easy to play, and then suddenly I've got to change how I think, talk, and act but only for two hours while I record a specific playthrough. Then I've got to record a completely different playthrough where my goals, ambitions, speech, etc. are all different again. So if the Nora episodes ever sound like Steven acting, then that's 100% because they are. Grid is just me, casually playing the game, but Nora is a different beast, and it is really hard to pull off. As I mentioned before, I kept the anagram dog names. Because Grit's dog was named after a real person, Mallory Weir, I decided that Brotherhood Nora's dog would be named after a real person, too. I named the dog Frosty X Hale, which is an anagram of Alex Forsyth, my best friend who has been in plenty of vlogs and also the Stephen and Friends series. Plus, Stay Frosty is a phrase that I've used often in videos, so it seemed really fitting. One of the ideas for the Nora episodes that's still semi-present is weapon origin stories. In the Minutemen playthrough, you'll see Nora using four melee weapons. The Power Fist, Pikmin's Blade, the Shish Kebab, and a legendary rolling pin. The idea was that, while all four weapons would be available to her in each playthrough, she'd largely focus on a different one each time. And during that playthrough's montage, you'd see a clip of how she obtained it. The rolling pin had been planned for Minutemen, but after I barely used it at all in that playthrough, because it sucked compared to the other weapons, I decided to scrap the inclusion of picking it up in the montage. The weapon planned for Brotherhood was the Power Fist, and I included a clip in the montage of defeating Swan and obtaining it. Ironically, the Power Fist isn't compatible with Power Armor, which I wear for nearly all of the Brotherhood playthrough, so it's actually barely shown at all. The weapons for Railroad and Institute were Pikmin's Blade and the Shish Kebab, respectively, but both were cut since it really didn't feel right in the montage. One of the strongest moments in all of the Nora episodes 
is the Brotherhood montage that ends with Nora killing Paladin Dance. And it's cut in such a way to show her immediate loyalty to the cause, but in actuality, I spent 20 minutes shooting that scene, exhausting every possible option so I could have a bunch of footage to work from. I wasn't sure if I wanted to paint Nora quite that heartless, and the extra footage gave me some options. I'm also super glad that Grit was able to redo that mission. Saving Dance and encountering Maxon outside is an incredible moment in the game. While creating the montage for the Brotherhood, I actually struggled a lot with the inclusion of certain material. Grit hadn't yet done the Distress Pulsar mission out in the Glowing Sea, but we needed to gloss over it in the montage, so I briefly considered leaving it out entirely. Likewise with Blind Betrayal. For some people, a montage would be the first time hearing that Dance was a synth, and I felt kind of bad about that. I didn't want to spoil that moment for folks, but I also knew how powerful ending on the gun blast was. So, in the end, I decided to keep it in. Leaving it out would have been difficult because I would have been spoiled about a mission that Grit was ultimately going to play, so it seemed better to just show that I had already experienced it. With the Brotherhood being complete, we moved on to the Railroad. So by now, I've explained that there was only one Nora run. Aside from plugging a leak early on, there was only one save and I'd reload to do all the missions. That means that when you're watching the montages for each playthrough, you can sometimes figure out where I was in the journey. I'd occasionally move things around to help them flow better, but clips are largely untouched. You'll notice in the Railroad montage that I'm in power armor when I first approach Desdemona. This was one of the only times I was in power armor during all the pre-commentary stuff, so if you spot me in power armor in another montage, it was almost certainly around the same time in the game. The dog naming scheme sort of fell apart on the Railroad playthrough. I wanted to do an anagram of Dan, or Daniel Sethembrini, another friend of ours who edits most of the content on Steven Plays. But while I could come up with anagrams, I couldn't come up with any that were good. There was none that were sensible or interesting. So I decided to drop the friend's names naming convention and go in a completely different direction. I named the dog Delta Ghost. Delta, meaning fourth, as it was the fourth dog on the series, Wilma, Dogmeat, Frosty, and now Delta, and Ghost referring to the railroad, who operated in secret. Some of the commenters had theorized that Delta Ghost was an anagram of The Last Dog, assuming that the Railroad playthrough would be the end of Nora, and then Grit would choose to side with the Institute. But it was actually just Stealth Dog. Again, playing into the fact that the Railroad employed a lot of stealth operations. Another great thing about the Nora episodes was showing off some of the side quests' alternative choices. One of my favorites being the Parsons Asylum quest, where you instead side with Lorenzo. In addition to getting infinite free serum, it was just so much fun to watch him get revenge on his family. Also some extra dialogue from Edward, too. When I had the ability, and also remembered, I tried to choose different dialogue options for Nora than what Grit originally chose. For instance, Grit never finished Underground Undercover because it's a turning point in the game, but he did finish a large portion of it. Nora does the mission too, and different dialogue is chosen. I would generally consider her character and how she would typically respond, though. The Railroad is also the only playthrough that shows Far Harbor's island in any capacity. Since the Railroad are friends to synths, it seemed most fitting to include the Dima interaction on this specific run. I'm sure some people were curious if I would include alternate Far Harbor endings in the Nora episodes, but to be quite honest, that was outside the scope or goals for this project. Between the release of Fallout 200 and Fallout 201, exactly one month of time passed. That's how long it took to record all 36 hours of footage, but then also edit it down into episode 201. Now, what I did was I took that 36 hours and I cut it and cut it and cut it and cut it and cut it, and eventually I had a nine hour timeline. That nine hour timeline was the basis for all of the playthroughs. So I took that nine hour timeline and made the Minutemen playthrough. Then I went back to that nine hour timeline and I made the Brotherhood playthrough. Same thing with Railroad, same thing with Institute. And after I released episode 201, there was no delays. I was able to back-to-back -back release all of the Minutemen episodes, uh, all of the Brotherhood episodes, and all of the Railroad episodes. But after the last Railroad episode came out, I did have to delay things for two weeks, just because there was other projects coming out, and also, it was the Christmas season. Institute Nora was probably the hardest character to roleplay, because I wanted her to actively evolve over a small amount of time. As a whole, each version of Nora was extremely loyal to their particular faction, but Institute Nora should be rooted not only in loyalty, but love for her son, who she now gets to work alongside. 
One of the major decisions I made in cutting the montage for this playthrough was to use the holotape with Grit's voice on it to firmly establish that this Nora was family Nora. She only cared about her son, and her only driving force was finding him. We don't show anything additional in that montage. Once you've heard the holotape, we open to the Institute. All of Nora's answers to Sean are positive. She is over the moon to be back in her child's life, and she wants to help. A lot of Institute Nora's choices and speech options are grounded in the idea of, I'm a mom again. My goal was that she'd still have the characteristics of a nurturing mother, who was learning the ropes of the Institute, but slowly evolves into someone who is a little more cold once they're far enough to become the future director. At the beginning of the montage, she's wide-eyed and excited, but by the end, she's freeing gorillas to murder people. On that subject, the dialogue between Nora and Lawrence leading up to that is actually a combination of several conversations. I reloaded multiple times to get every single option, and then I cut it up in post. It's actually some of the most interesting dialogue in the Institute, so I included most of it, to the point where it's not actually possible to hear what I showed in a single playthrough. You would have to reload a few times. I was also undecided if I wanted to kill the scientists or not, since it's possible to have a peaceful solution. But since Grit went the peaceful route, and Nora was becoming colder, I opted to include the gorilla scene. To be honest, it was actually the very last thing I decided on, once the entire Institute playthrough was already cut. There is a continuity error, although it's barely noticeable. Because I shot the gorilla scene last, I reloaded an earlier save to get all the conversation footage and to show the gorillas themselves, I had already finished the Institute playthrough, including a scene where the deceased scientists are still alive and listening to Father give a speech. I caught this myself, but I still included it since I figured no one would notice. The final dog anagram is probably my personal favorite, Gonad Sushi. It's just a fun, wacky name that's quite fitting for a dog that's about to bite your nuts off. There was a lot of debate about this one, but the anagram is a very ominous, Sean is God used to reflect how Nora and much of the Institute views and treats Sean. It's also worth noting that recording the final mission of the Institute, where you destroy the Brotherhood, took me twice as long as it should have, because I died the first time. When I was nearly at the end, and actively shooting Maxon, who was in a helicopter, a guy behind me took me down. Last save point was before I even started. I had a lot of leftover footage that I intended to include in the Institute montage, but ultimately, I killed that idea off when I went the family holotape route. Which leads me to the next part of the video, the scrap heap. The scene with Fred, Jules, and Angie at the beginning of most playthroughs has additional footage that wasn't used. Minuteman Nora convinces them to let Jules go. Brotherhood Nora convinces them to kill Jules. Railroad Nora threatens them to let Jules go. But we also have a recording of killing Fred and Angie ourselves. And also killing Jules. Obviously, this didn't fit anywhere, so it went unused. There were plenty of additional quests that were filmed, but ultimately didn't fit anywhere. One such example was Zhao's submarine, which Grit has already done. The only other outcome is killing Zhao, which felt cruel for any of the Noras, so it was left out. I also recorded the entirety of Confidence Man, the quest with Travis, the radio DJ. Because the Institute sends you to the radio station later on, I figured that it'd be kind of nice to include that in the montage. But, when I decided to use just the family holotape, this entire mission got scrapped too. Some quests were completed, but they didn't bring anything new to the table, so they were left out. For example, Nora did the Boston Library quest for Daisy and Good Neighbor, but it's the same quest that Grit did, and the outcome was the same, so it didn't make any sense to include it. I actually recorded a ton of dialogue options for when you first meet the vault Tech guy, but I don't believe we used more than one. I didn't know if we'd need battle b-roll, so there is a ridiculous amount of footage of me just fighting things, including one long stretch where I punch an entire island of Mirelurks to death. I mentioned it earlier, but the weapon origin stories for both Pikmin's Blade and the Shish Kebab were cut, and each are complete and quite long quests. While I did obtain Piper's perk, I left the perk talk out, and actively tried to avoid showing her in footage when I could. And now, here's a few cool details that you may have missed. While Grit uses a green HUD, Nora uses a blue HUD. This is because my favorite color is green, and Mao's favorite color is blue. But this wasn't decided until recording had already started for the Nora episodes, so at the end of Fallout 200, Nora is still using the green HUD. There's quite a bit of blurring slash titling to replace the default male name Nate with Grit in Fallout 200's end sequence. 
Custom titling is done again in Fallout 210's intro montage to show that Grit is talking. Throughout the Fallout 4 series, I've always used chevrons to transition between scenes. In episodes featuring Grit, the chevrons move to the right, but in the Nora episodes, they move to the left. Did you notice the Fallout logo on the thumbnail has inversed colors on episodes that feature Nora? This is also a throwback to the Skyrim series, which did a similar thing. Episodes featuring Argyle had the Nord on the right, whereas episodes featuring Feindel had the Nord on the left. The Nord is in the center for the finale. In the montage sections of all the playthroughs, Nora can be seen wearing a hard hat as a nod to her husband. Grit has a special intro for his episodes, taken from the Fallout 4 commercial. Nora has a different intro, taken from a different part of the same commercial. Because it features a male actor, I used a part where the person is in power armor so you wouldn't be able to tell. The four-color transition at the end of each playthrough, as we switch back to Grit, was a very last-minute addition. I had already finished editing the Minutemen playthrough when I suddenly decided to add it in. I ran it by Mao, who liked it, so we kept it. Originally, each of the four playthroughs were going to be a single episode each, meaning that there would only be four Nora episodes, and they would all be 90-plus minutes long. Chaz was actually the one who talked me out of this, saying that it would be a lot less stressful if I just stretched each playthrough across three episodes. He was right. Some commenters worried that Nora doing all the factions simply meant that Grit would never choose a faction. To be honest, that was never a consideration. Not finishing the game with the primary character kind of makes things feel incomplete. Generally, in order to get banished from the Institute, needed to get the peaceful ending that Grit got, you need to kill someone in the Institute. I was very against this, as it would have been hugely against Grit's character. Thankfully, warning the Brotherhood and starting Spoils of War enables you to complete the Banished from the Institute quest without having to harm anyone. So I've done my best to incorporate the questions that you left on Fallout 221 into the video so far, but here's a few explicit questions that I'll just answer directly. Why is each version of Nora so different in Grit's head? From an entertainment perspective, I thought it'd be a lot more interesting to have each Nora be slightly different. They're all the same person. They're all married to Grit, Sean is their son, they all have low intelligence and high strength, etc. But each timeline explores a different side of Nora. The Minutemen Nora is a well-rounded one, because that's a reflection of the group she's with. With the Brotherhood, I imagine Nora exiting the vault full of anger that her husband is killed. In fact, I left some dialogue in the montage to reflect this, and she learns that synths are behind it. So finding Paladin Dance and the Brotherhood gives her structure, but also a place to direct that anger, the Institute. While each Nora might seem extreme, and certainly they are, as that's more entertaining, I still view them all as the same person. Each timeline is Grit thinking, well, if this happened, I could definitely see Nora doing this. Personally, I believe that everyone is capable of a wide variety of decisions, depending on the specific circumstances that they're put into. Was Mao ever considered to play the Nora episodes? I started getting this question when Fallout 201 came out, and honestly, I can't understand it. There were a few people disappointed that Mao wasn't the one playing and commentating the Nora episodes. I mean, I, I get that there's a parallel of Grit and Nora to myself and Mao, but honestly, it ends there. See, a big problem is time. It took so, so long to produce these episodes, even just the commentary parts. Mao needs all the time she can get to work on Mao makes. But the biggest issue by far is that Mao has no idea what my plans for this series are. She doesn't know the nuances and references and self-made lore that's been established in the last 200 episodes. She has never watched an episode of Fallout 4. So I can use Nora's character to make callback jokes to Grit, and that is something that she would just never be able to do. Simply put, it was never considered because it would have been completely impossible, or at the very least, it would have drastically lowered the quality of the overall project. Did you use any mods to create the Nora episodes? No. Not a single one. It was all done vanilla on the same Xbox One that I've been using the whole time. And I shouldn't be proud about that, but I really am. See, for what I envisioned with Skyrim, it was important to have the mod created. But with Fallout, I really wanted to try and do everything completely legit. The fact that I was able to create these alternate universes and legitimately play through the game a second time without any mods or cheating makes me really happy. It's a weird but nice victory. What made you decide to show off the Nora endings before Grit? 
honestly, mostly the desire to surprise the audience. 200 episodes in and everyone is still guessing about what faction Grith is going to choose. I thought it'd be fun to keep that guessing game up a little longer, so I elected to do the Nora endings first. Doing all of them just meant that no one could truly see what Grit was going to do until he did it. What was your favorite ending? So, this will probably be a bit weird, but uh, Grit and I diverge a little on ending preference. For Grit's character, based on his relationships with companions, I think the peaceful ending was absolutely the right choice. But for Stephen George, personally, I really enjoyed the Institute ending. I mean, if I was playing the game for fun in my spare time, and not worrying about creating lore or completing all the missions, uh, I'd say I'd be like 50-50 on whether to go after the peaceful ending or the Institute ending. Was Nora also polyamorous? Okay, so I feel responsible only for crafting the story that's on screen. Everything beyond that is open to interpretation. Uh, I imagine that Grit developed poly feelings after losing everyone close to him. That his desire for multiple companions arose out of the great loss that he experienced. Grit's entire existence is basically meeting new people and loving them earnestly. He's experienced loss, and he's trying to combat that by being as close to as many people as he can. How long did it take to make the Nora episodes? Well over 100 hours. Easy. The actual recording took 36 hours, but it took plenty of time to then catalog what was in each of the clips, edit it down to a more manageable 9 hours, and then take that 9 hour timeline and edit it down 4 different times to 90 minutes each. I vastly underestimated how long it would take, but the scope of the project also changed dramatically too. Uh, and for those interested in file size, the Nora video files are 330 gigabytes in total. You had a plan for Nora's character, did you also have a plan for Grit? Eh, not really. I mean, similar to Argyle and Skyrim, these characters are just an extension of myself, which is also why they're so easy to commentate and roleplay. In both instances of Argyle and Grit, I started with a blank slate and let the adventure steer the characters into who they would become. With Grit, the only thing I knew from the beginning is I wanted a maxed out charisma. Having the ability to talk my way through any conversation made Grit unique and I enjoyed that. How exactly do you get the peaceful ending? So the short version is, don't piss anyone off. There's turning point missions throughout the game, and if you do one of them, it generally comes up on screen and says, you will become enemies with blank faction. So obviously you want to avoid all of those. Um, there's actually a really great video that summarizes everything very beautifully, and I'll put a link to that in the description if you're truly interested. And finally, what could you have done better? The one thing I wish I would have caught early on and fixed was that I should have had the music off entirely for all of the montage stuff. Because I added music in myself, I didn't need the game's music, and it actually made it a lot harder to edit. But hey, now I know for the next time I do something crazy like this. And I think that just about wraps it up for the mini-doc. You guys could probably tell, but Nora Jones and the Nora episodes were a passion project. Fallout 4 is a passion project, similar to how Skyrim, especially near the end of Skyrim, was a passion project. I'm very enthusiastic about these games and also the stories that I'm crafting within these games. It means a lot to me and it's something that I like to spend time on because I figure if I'm going to do something, I want to do it right. I want to do it justice. And that's why I've really tried to pour my heart and soul into doing things like Fallout 4. So. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you enjoyed the character and the episodes, and I hope that maybe this mini-doc shed some new light on those episodes. Maybe after watching this, you'll go back and uh, watch the Fallout 4 Nora episodes and say, hey, now I know this things I didn't know this before. Now, this is an episode of Fallout 4, whether you think it should count as one or not, which means that next episode, Grit will be returning. There are still some things to do, including uh, some stuff in the Commonwealth, but very soon he'll be on his way to Nuka World. We are in the last chapter of Fallout 4, and it feels weird to say that since I've been playing this game for almost two and a half years, but it's been fun. And uh, let's just say that I have plans to finish just as strong as I started. Thank you so much for watching. 
and I'll see you next time for more Stephen Plays Fallout 4.